So I don't think I'm going to say anything um, revolutionary when I say that the world is not the way it should be. And, you know, I know that we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But I think sometimes rather than creating a hell, a heaven on earth, I think sometimes we've gone the other way and sometimes made things harder and harder and harder. You know, um, it seems like every single year the prevalence of anxiety and depression seem to rise. And, and I know that there are a lot of things out there that people, uh, have kind of put their, their trust in, their faith in. Um, at various points, and let's be honest, they've not all turned out the way that we thought they would. You know, when I was a when I was growing up, uh, one of the cartoons that I had when I was growing up was the Jetsons. So, the Jetsons was, uh, and again, back in the the seventies, this cartoon family where you know the the father worked five to ten hours a week, and I all the rest of the time was at home. You know, that was kind of the hope of what the future was going to be, that we'd have all this time because automation would take care of everything, and we would have more time. We'd have so much, we'd get so much done in such a short period of time in the office that we'd have all this time at home. How's that working out? Um, because the reality is, um, if you look kind of statistically, the number of hours people are working has gone up and up. And up, and I also know even among my retired friends that they tell me that they're more busy now than they were when they were working. And and it's almost as if business has become a badge of honor. Well, how are you doing? I'm busy. How many people have answered that question that way? I. It's not. I, I've gotten to the point where I say I'm busy. Oh man, what's wrong with me? Because I know better. I know that's not the way I'm supposed to be. Um. You know, we uh, we live in a world in which I think the environment around us continues to get more and more stressful. And, you know, I, I think part of it is we're continually told we don't have enough. We we need these things to be happy. We need these things to be satisfied. We need, um, you know, and, and again, there's entire industries that have been dedicated to telling us, you know, buy this and it'll satisfy what you need. Um, you know, we go into... Um, you know, whether it's we go into things like social media, you know, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or all this, we go into it looking for connection and we find disconnection. We go into public spaces looking for connection and we find disconnection. We find places where instead of being welcomed, we're, we're told we're not welcome. And, you know, we, I think, have become less and less satisfied with who we are and what we have. And, and again, there are all kinds of people trying to give compelling answers of what is the solution to this. And for most people who are saying what the solution to that is, those, most of those answers have nothing to do with God. And I would say that probably most of us in this room know people who are, who are very, very smart people, who are very gifted in many parts of their life and have nothing to do with faith and it's not because they're not smart people. It's because, you know, let's be honest, there are other compelling act, uh, uh, compelling narratives, other compelling uh, things saying, hey, give me your time, give me your worship, give me your, your resources. And I will give you I will give you Joy, I will make your life worth living. And I, on the other side, I mean, let's be honest. As people of faith, it didn't inoculate us from having troubles in life. It doesn't ino it doesn't make us happy every single moment of the day. It doesn't make everything work out the way it is. And yet, maybe I'm stubborn. Maybe I've just got a thick head. I'm not willing to give up on God. I'm not willing to give up on God, and I do think that there's something in these two stories that we have today that, that resonate with that. You know, that 
part of it is, you know, we see the way in which God works in, in the world sometimes, and we see the people who God sometimes does things through, and you say, okay, God, what are you up to? Or how is this working out? How is this the, the way it's supposed to be? Well, we all know, uh, you know, God's people were, um, through, the, through the Hebrew Scriptures, through the Old Testament, were the people of Israel. But I think there's something telling in the person who the nation gets its name from. So, Jacob is the second born son, second of twins. Um, there's Jacob and Esau, and they're born um, <clears throat> to Isaac and Rachel. Or Isaac and Rebecca, sorry. <clears throat> and from the very beginning, even when they're named, um, there's conflict from the very beginning of that relationship. So, so Jacob gets his name from the fact that he's the second born, but he's grasping onto the heel of his older brother as he comes out of the womb. Uh, which that would have been a really horrible delivery. Um, beside the point, but that's how he gets his name. He's he's uh, called Jacob, which means heel grasper, which in that culture, Jacob means also trickster. The idea of, of grasping after a heel is the idea of, you know, the person who reaches out and grabs the person's heel to trick him up. And his life lives like that. So um, I, a lot of you probably heard like in, in Sunday school the, the story of, of Jacob and Esau and you know how not once but twice with the help of his mother he tricks uh, Esau out of his first his birthright and then his blessing and Esau kind of comes out in the story as almost like Conan the barbarian character of ugh me go hunt ugh me go me hungry you know and he doesn't come off as the, the sharpest um, the sharpest stick or anything else like that but so you know, first he comes back and he comes back and he's hungry. He's been out hunting. He hasn't been successful. And he comes back and he sees his, uh, his brother Jacob making a, a stew. And so he says, give me some of that. And Jacob, you know, for, okay, for your birthright, I'll give you stew. Give me stew. You know. And then, um, and again, his mother plays a part in this too, where, you know, his father's old. He's almost blind. And so he wants to give his final blessing to his, his son. His mother has him go and put on, you know, goat skin on his arms and, and bring him a freshly made meal and everything else like that and tricks his father into giving him his blood, the blessing instead of Esau. And, and this begins a long period of life where Jacob enters into this world where either he's the one being tricked or he's the trickster. You know, he has to, to run away from his brother uh, Esau because, again, he's tricked him out of his birthright, he's tricked him out of his blessing. And so his brother's angry at him, so he runs away, and he, as he runs away, he, he encounters uh, the, the famous uh, Jacob's Ladder, where you have the, have the angels ascending and descending from heaven, and he says, okay, well, God, if, if you'll do all these things for me, then you'll be my God. You know, if you do all these things for me, then, then I'll worship you. And, and God doesn't correct him on that. God says, okay. God allows him to go on his way, but he goes into and he goes in with it to meet his his uncle to live in his household for a little while. Um, his uncle proves to be a trickster, so he tricks him into marrying uh, the older daughter, and when he wants to marry the younger daughter, and and again, and he ends up tricking the uncle. And and you know, there's a a line you'll sometimes see on uh, the. Uh, on like things that are ro romantic, of let the Lord, may the Lord watch between you and me while we're separate. Just so you know, that has nothing to do with romance. That is basically, I'm putting a pile of stones on the ground. If you cross that line of stones, may God watch you because I'm not going. It's a threat. And so what, what kind of gets taken out of context is actually a threat of, I won't cross this line of stones, you don't cross this line of stones, because if we do, we're liable to kill each other. Anyway, so Jacob, this has all happened earlier in Jacob's life. He's kind of, he's seeing away from his, his uncle. He's, he's made this line where don't, he shall not pass this line. He's heading back, and he knows he's coming up on his, uh, his brother Esau. He's hoping he can reconcile that relationship, but he also knows that he's been the trickster who's wronged him in the past. And it's at this point, right before he's about to meet his brother Esau. So he's, he's done all these things to kind of say, well, how can I mitigate my risk? How can I... How can I make it to where, you know, if I lose part of my household, I don't lose all of my household. So he's made all these plans. He's done everything. 
And that's the point where he sent everybody else across the river. He's by himself. And we have this really strange scene where you have Jacob wrestling with a man who, um, and he wrestles the entire night. And, and again, this is an open question in the story. Well, who is it he's really wrestling with? And we get the, the impression towards the end that maybe in some strange way or form or, or something that maybe he was wrestling with God. But the reality is several things changed in the midst of that time. One of them is that from that point forward, he walks with a limp. He doesn't come out of that time unchanged, unmarked. He's no longer able to rely on, you know, his own physical ability or his own physical prowess. You know, at this point forward, he walks with a limp. But he's also no longer the trickster. He's no longer Jacob. Changing a name is a, a significant thing in that culture because it changes who you are. And again, the name Israel wrestled with God. And, you know, he and those who come after him, who are the people of God, will continue to wrestle with, with God. Of, well, who, what is God's will for the world? What are you calling us to do? Sometimes, sometimes they'll do it well. Sometimes they will be like Moses going up and saying, okay, God, this is who you said you would be. I, we're, call, we're asking you to be this for us. And at other times, they would try God's patience. And I'm sure we do at times too. But God didn't give up on Jacob all throughout this journey. And there were a lot of times where I think God could have. And there are a lot of times where Jacob put demands on God and, and God says, I'm still going to work. And we might look at people like Jacob and, or Israel and say, why does God choose them? But we could also look at ourselves and say, well, why does God choose us? Why does God choose to work through us? When Jesus tells this parable about a widow um, who, who comes Again and again, and it's not putting God in the the position of the unjust judge, you know. But this judge who the widow comes to refuses to hear, hear her case based on the merits of the case. He refuses to hear her case because maybe she doesn't have anything she can offer. Maybe, maybe it's just too much work. Have y'all ever been in a place where you? Now, I, I hate to use the DMV. Um, but I think most people have been in some kind of situation where you're dealing with some kind of bureaucracy and it seems like the people are moving in slow motion. Or they're doing the absolute bare minimum of what they need to do to get through that day to get their job done. And if you, know, if you have people waiting in line out the door, so be it. That's not their problem. Or uh, you go up to a place... Uh, uh, go up to a place to eat and, you know, there's not a line in front of it. And you know there's not a line because everybody there is just, again, they look like they're the, the robots that have gone to low power or something like that. You know, I only ordered uh, uh, a four-piece order of chicken. We'll be with you in 45 minutes. You know, there are times, there are all kinds of ways in which people can say, well, I don't have time for you, or you're not important enough for me, or, or whatever that happens to be. And when that person has power over you, when that person, you know, can control whether you get justice or not, and I know there are lots of people who, for various reasons, I, I don't think most people would, would argue with the reality that, um, you know, you can get a good lawyer, you're far more likely to get the, the decision you want. But, but regardless, we have a widow who refuses to give up, refuses to give up on this, jo this, this judge who, want, who doesn't want to do his job, who doesn't want to uh, you know, respect her, doesn't have any kind of moral reasons to do the job, but he's in that position anyway. And this widow refuses to give up and says, you know, I refuse to give up on this system. I refuse to give up on this is the way that things are supposed to be. I refuse to give up on this society where 
things should be better than the way they are. I refuse to give up. I refuse to let this be the answer. I refuse for no to be the final answer in the midst of this. So she comes again and again and again and again and she persists. And finally, she gets her way. The judge says, not because of the merits of the case, although the merits of the case apparently are in her favor, not because of the merits of the case, but because I'm tired of listening to her. I'm finally going to give her what she wants. The squeaky oil gets the grease this time. Not that God is the unjust judge. And not that we necessarily have anything that we can come and contribute and offer to God. And not because, you know, our prayers are going to be answered exactly the way that we want them to be answered or because everything that we bring to God has the same level of merit or or anything else like that. But even despite some of the evidence to the contrary in the midst of the world, even despite all the different things in this world that are not the way that they should be, even in spite of all the things that seem to go wrong from time to time, I've not given up on God. And I do think that, I do believe that God can make things different. I do believe that God's kingdom can come, that God's will can be done on earth as in heaven. And sometimes that means I need to change. Sometimes it means I have to stop being just kneel and and I have to be one who can wrestle with God in that. Sometimes that means that I may walk with a limp. Sometimes it means I may have to go and engage part of that. But I don't give up. And again, there are lots of times in my life where something has been on my heart and I've come to it over and over and over again. I feel like I'm a broken record. And maybe God feels like I'm a broken record too. But I'm not content with the way things are. I don't know what other answers to give other than the fact that I refuse to give up on God in this. There are times where, yeah, God calls me to move beyond my prayers, you know, not to just send thoughts and prayers for somebody, but but also to be a part of the solution. But I think my thoughts and my prayers, they matter too. You know, I I do believe that, yes, we work together with God to bring about the kingdom of of God, that we, we try to create this. I would much rather create a heaven on earth than the alternative. And yet... God's kingdom doesn't come by my work alone. It's not all on my shoulders. It's not all on what I can do. At best, you know, the power that I have is no different than that of the widow. It comes again and again. Maybe I'm delusional, but I refuse to give up on this possibility. That God can be at work in our world. That God can make things better. That God can help us be who we're called to be. That God can help us make this world a better place. You know, I'm not giving up on it. And, and, you know, faith in the New Testament is not about this kind of content of, you know, do you, do you confess all the right things? Do you believe all the right things? really about trust. Do you trust that God can work in this situation? So may we continue to come to God again and again and again. May we lift up the things of our hearts, the, the things that we see in the world that our eyes are open to, the places where the world is broken, where things don't work the way they are, the places where instead of making things better, we've made things worse. May we lift them up to God. And sometimes the God, God will change the world around us, and sometimes God will change us in relation to the world. But I do think the path of faith is not the path of, you know, this is just the way it's always been. We believe that God calls us to be like this widow. He comes again and again. Hear the justice of my case. Give me justice against those who make the world a worse place. 
Lord God, help us to come to you. May you indeed find faith. May you indeed find those who will trust that you are still at work in the world. And come again.